In this video for iScout Basketball, we will cover some of the design concepts used for collecting data. Home and away rosters and their related controls are cleanly separated along the sides of the device with the court and the event controls in the center area. Those event controls are inactive until you select either a player or a team and this prevents accidental entries. We use color coding to help you visually find your place on the screen when looking between the game and the screen. We have set up with different team colors which are controlled by the user in the team information. We also have the controls for positive events in green and those for the negative events are red. At the bottom of each list of players is a button indicating a team for events. This is useful when we don't want to track the player for the event, which is likely for the opposing team, and it can also be used in cases where we miss the player responsible for the event, but want to log the event so that later we have the option to correct the player information. Other apps do not have this flexibility. Each of our player numbers are visible on the controls, and we provide the option to use a three-character abbreviation or nickname in cases where the jersey numbers are not available. One of the few times where you have to leave the main screen is when dealing with subs. At the top of each of the lists of players is a brown icon for selecting subs for that particular team. For the home team in this example, there is an indicator for a timer in the sub button. In this case, for the home team, we want to track the amount of playing time per player. The result is that we are limited to five players in the game at one time, and to change that, we go to the sub page and make adjustments. We select player substitution, we adjust the time if necessary to match the clock and continue on. The opposing team's button does not have a timer because we've decided not to track their playing time. This is one of the innovations that sets this app apart. Instead we can scroll the list in order to see the players or we can touch above and below the dot control to move to see the rest of the players. When adding events, the sequence is to first select a player, or we can select a team, and then we pick the event that we want to record. What we have recorded will show up at the bottom of the screen as feedback that we have added that event. The most common events are available at this top interface level. If we want, we can dig deeper after we record an event. We can see this example by adding a foul, at the bottom of the screen is a blue arrow indicating there's more information for a foul. Selecting that, we see the other information and we can add details about the foul event. Likewise, if we add a turnover event, similarly, we get a list of details to add to that event. Most of the events, however, are just two touches, using one to select the player or team and one to select the event. In the case of shots, we touch the player and then touch the court to indicate where the shot occurred. We also have the ability to adjust this event. By clicking on the court and sliding, and I can click anywhere, you'll notice that the value as I move across the three-point line changes to indicate the shot value. In this case, the indicator is red, telling me that the shot was missed. If I click the court, I have the chance to change that to a made shot. You probably noticed that as we added shots for the home team, they defaulted to missed. You have to touch the court afterward to change them to made shots. The reason for this is that missed shots occur way more often than made shots, and if you want the shooting percentage, you have to track both of these. This seemed to be a more efficient way to do this. What we've done for the opposing team is different. In this example, we don't care about their percentages, so in the game setup, we default their shots to made. This allows us to track where their shots were from in simply two touches. Again, cutting down the total touches. We're going to remove these last couple events. Another innovation is the ability to record the events in any order. If, for example, I had an assist for a shot, sometimes it is better to add the assist first because it's more likely to lose track of in the course of the game. Then afterwards, we can add the shot. Likewise, if we are in a free throw situation, there is an opportunity to sub players at that point and we are not locked into adding the events in any certain order so we can make those adjustments.
If I need to add events further back in the game, I can use the event log to do so at any point in the game. One of the toughest things to deal with during a live game is correcting mistakes. We have several options for doing so. The simplest way is to delete the most recent event by swiping the bottom area and selecting delete. It can also bring up the last event, in this case for a shot, and make a decision on how to edit it. I can also change the player for any event. If I need to change an event that happened earlier in the game, I can use the event log. Locate the event and make the change. I can also search through the event log using a filter if I'm trying to find a particular event. Using a log is likely something you would do when there's a pause in the action or reviewing a game afterwards. For more information, please visit our website.